Perfect. Okay, so hello everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of Global Lawyers of Canada Virtual Mental Office Hours. Today we are joined by Kyle Riddell, who is an associate with Demoulin Black um, LLP. They are a leading corporate securities firm based in Vancouver in British Columbia. Kyle is an internationally trained lawyer. He went to the University of Liverpool in England and um, before coming over and going through the MCA route. Um, He's going to be talking today about an introduction to private placements. This is the bread and butter for securities lawyers. This is how our clients raise some money. Um, and there's various different ways we can do it. So I'm going to let Kyle go into all of those details. Um, but don't forget, use the chat box, ask your questions, and we'll come to them later. Kyle, over to you. Thank you, Siobhan. That's, uh, you're making private placements sound very attractive. So thank you for that. Um, hi everyone and thanks to Siobhan and the GLC team for inviting me to present here today. Uh, if you could just please, as Siobhan said, just keep your uh, microphones on mute, that would be great. So just a bit about what we'll be talking about today. Uh, this presentation provides an overview of how certain public and private companies raise money in Canada. In particular, we will be dealing with how the companies complete private placements from each company's perspective, the differences between public and private companies completing a private placement, compliance requirements under Canadian securities laws, and the potential obstacles along the way that could delay or even prevent the private placement from closing. Just a, a word of warning here, the purpose of this presentation is to provide a general overview as to how companies raise money in Canada. This is in no way a comprehensive guide to be adopted. As such, there are components to the private placement process that will not be dis discussed in today's presentation that companies would also need to consider if they choose to complete the private placement. So the contents of this presentation should not be construed as legal advice or investment advice in any way. As Siobhan alluded to a bit of my background there, I am an associate at Taboon & Black, which is a downtown Vancouver law firm. Uh, just a bit of additional background, I went to law school in the UK originally. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work at some top tier firms, uh, M&A firms in Australia, and also in the public sector at the New Zealand Commerce Commission. I came to Canada just over three and a half years ago now, uh, in which I completed my NTAs in August 2019, and then I became a member of the Law Society of BC in 2020. Just to set the scene for our discussion today, um, the, the scenario that we will be discussing is an individual approaches the company and wishes to complete a non broker private placement for common shares. A couple of things to note here, non-brokered private placement basically means a, a transaction directly with the company. A private placement means the sale and purchase of securities relying on an exemption that does not require the company to file a prospectus with the applicable regulators. For the purposes of this scenario, the common shares are non-flow through Two types of shares, non-flow through and flow through. Flow through tend to have a tax component to them, which we will not be discussing in today's presentation. And usually for flow through private placement, the proceeds will be used for resource properties uh, and expenditures. Whereas non-flow through, it's straight common shares and you can use the proceeds however you disclose that they will be useful. The individual investor is a BC resident. The reason why that is important is because different provinces and different jurisdictions have different requirements. BC is different to Ontario and everything is different to the US. So for this purpose, we will rely on the BC resident. The purchase price is paid in cash. There are ways in which you can receive securities, for example, in consideration for providing services to the company. For this purpose, it is an individual who will pay cash for those common shares. And finally, there will be no finder's fees. 
So a finder is someone who introduces an investor to the company and in return, they usually receive a fee from the company for that introduction. There will be a couple of additional hurdles to get over if there was a finder. For this, um, for this presentation, we will not be focusing on that. In a nutshell, what I've done here is I've just summarized the process of a typical private placement. From the point of view of a private company incorporated in BC, a CSE issuer and a TSXV issuer. Issuer just being another word for a company, however they are listed on that exchange. As you can see, they're mainly all applicable to all three categories apart from the stock exchange filings. In particular to note here, Canadian securities law considerations do apply to all three. We will touch on uh, each of these steps in more detail. So the first objective, investor comes to you and says, I want to do a private placement. What the company should say is, okay, great, I'll get a subscription agreement for you. A subscription agreement is effectively the contract between the company and the individual for the sale and purchase of those common shares. It will set out certain terms governing the private placement, including the price per common share. For private companies, this is very, this is a lot more straightforward, I should say. It's normally dictated by the directors of the company. However, for CSC and TSXV companies, there are uh, pricing requirements under stock exchange policies to be aware of. For example, if the uh, price of a company is 50 cents, then under CSC and TSXV policies, the company may offer the sale of common shares um, at a discounted market price. And that is usually up to 25% of the closing market price. So if we take today, we'll take the closing price as of yesterday and we'll apply the discounted market price. The subscription agreement will also set out the Canadian prospectus exemption to be relied on for the purchase of the shares. I guess as a general rule, a company will always need to file a prospectus for a distribution of securities if it cannot rely on an exemption. There are a few exemptions that we mainly deal with. It's not to say that all law firms deal with the same most common ones, but this is just what I typically deal with. This includes accredited investor, friends and family, and the minimum amount. And we'll go into detail of these three exemptions on the next slide. And finally, it sets out some reps and warranties of the individual as the jurisdiction, exemption, and resale restrictions. So what this really does, is it affords a bit of comfort to the company. It says it allows the investor to confirm to them that I am who I say I am. I I'm able to rely on this exemption, and I am resident of the jurisdiction that I say I am. As to resale restrictions, typically there will be a restriction on the trade of that common shares uh, four month and one day after its issuance. And what the subscription does, it will set out that the investor acknowledges that, just so the investor doesn't have the possibility or even the thought that it can trade the common shares for a higher price straight away after it's bought them. Just a bit more information about these uh, potential exemptions that an individual can rely on. As I said, the accredited investor is the most popular or the most common that I see. And what it means is if you fit one of these thresholds, then you can subscribe for common shares in the private placement. The most common is where an individual earns in the last two years, 200,000 Canadian dollars. Sometimes that's not always possible. So you have to find an alternative, which means you could look to the next one, which is together with your spouse, you earn a total of 300,000 Canadian dollars in the two most recent calendar years. If for example, you, earn 150,000 a year, and you might not be able to rely on the first and second exemption. You might have some 
uh, money tied up in stocks or, or other securities in some way. So there is an exemption which might be applicable for individuals who have financial assets uh, before taxes and net of any related liabilities exceeding 1 million Canadian dollars. The fourth one, which I set out there, actually applies to companies. It doesn't always have to be an individual that can rely on the accredited investor exemption. It can be a company as well. And the reason I put it there is because it's a lot more common than you think. For example, if I own a company, I'm the sole 100% owner, it says that I, as the company, can rely on the accredited investor exemption if all of the beneficial owners are themselves an accredited investor. What that's really saying is if I, as the owner, fit one of these uh, descriptions, then I can rely on this uh, in my company name. Just moving on to the friends and family exemption, this is typically for people close to a company who know that they're going to complete a private placement. The most obvious being if you're a director, executive officer, founder or control person of a company. I'll just refer to these as people close to the company. They have an easy exemption that they can rely on. They will be subject to additional requirements which we'll come on to, but they don't have to go through the hurdle of trying to figure out what exemption applies to them. If you are close to a company, but you're not a director or officer or one of those people, you still might be able to rely on an exemption. If you are a spouse or family member, a close personal friend, or a close business associate. These are just the uh, most common categories. There are several that do also fit under the accredited investor and also the friends and family that are not listed in this table. But this is kind of a general overview. And finally, the minimum amount exemption. Again, this is purely for companies, but I thought I'd just put it up here for illustration. What this means is if you are purchasing securities, if they were purchasing common shares and they have a value of 200,000 Canadian dollars, then you've already met an exemption. You don't need to jump through hoops and try and fit into the accredited investor or the friends and family, which typically require extra paperwork to be completed. So next step in, in the process is internal approval. The easiest way to do this is through the board of directors. Some, it, what they can do is simply put a document together, signed off by the directors, approving all of the terms of the private placement. Or they could hold a meeting, and at the meeting, they can approve, again, the terms of the private placement. Shareholder approval is not always required, but it can be depending on the circumstances. For example, TSXV will require shareholder approval if a control person is, uh, will, be, will be made as a result of the private placement. The reason this could delay or even prevent the private placement is because if a shareholder approval is meeting, it is required, sorry, then you will need to hold a shareholder meeting, which typically takes between 90, uh, 60 to 90 days, and it can cost up, up to a couple of thousand dollars, depending on where you are. Um, <clears throat> the, Definition of control person under TSXV policies it is a bit comprehensive for our purposes. It means that as a result of the private placement, that individual will hold more than 20% of the shares of the company. If that's the case, then you may have to approach the TSXV and say, we think there's going to be a control person and uh, hope that they do not require you to get shareholder approval. Again, it depends on the circumstances of the private placement that you take this into consideration. If there is only one person and you know that they're going to go over 20%, this will obviously need to be taken into consideration from the outset before you even start the subscription agreement and internal approval. So the next step applies only to CSC and TSXV issuers. And that's saying that, you know, now we have our approval and we've got a subscription agreement in place. 
we need to announce this thing. So the way in which you can uh, announce the price or reserve the price, if you will, firstly is by a news release. And what this will do is using the pricing guidelines that I, that I set out earlier, you'll disseminate a news release and file this so the public can see, which basically sets out your intention to complete it. If you're a TSXB issuer, there is another way that you can do this, and that's by filing a Form 4A, Price Reservation Form, with the TSXB. It will simply be a notice saying, hey TSXB, we plan to complete the private placement. We don't know all of the details of the private placement just yet, but we want to lock in this price, and that's one of the ways that you can do it. Additional requirements depending on which ex exchange you're listed on. CSE, uh, you'll be required to file a draft Form 9 on, on the company's profile, which is on the CSE website. Again, this is more of a draft form than a completed one. It's given the public a heads up that of your intention to complete a private placement and all the details that you know at that time. You might not know all of it and it might follow, but that's, that's what the objective is. Similarly, with the TSXB, you'll send to the TSXB an initial form 4B. Again, this is a draft form setting out all the information that you know so far. It doesn't have to be complete and accurate. Some of the answers can be unknown at this time, but it's more to give them a heads up and saying, this is what we plan to do. Um, let me know if you have any issues, really. So after you pay the filing fee and you file it with the TSXV, there will be a conditional acceptance from the exchange. The difference between CSE and TSXV is this approval process. The CSE is purely procedural, if you will, whereas the TSXV, you do need approvals along the way in order to move on to the next step. So whether you're a private company who's just approved it by board resolutions or your CSC issuer who's just filed the Form 9 or TSXB who's just received conditional acceptance, you can now proceed to close and move on to the issuance of the common shares. So the important thing here is that payment must be received prior to the issuance of the shares. Under Canadian securities laws, uh, securities must be fully paid and non-assessable. So what that means is I can't issue you common shares today for payment tomorrow. It has to be the other way around or even on the same day. It cannot be shares before payment. If you're a private company, uh, this is typically done in-house and what the company themselves will, will normally do is issue and deliver the share certificates to the investor and then they will update the central securities register this is typically a list of the shareholders to date, which is kept in-house. The CSE and TSXB issuers, um, they would have to have a transfer agent, which is a typical uh, third party who maintain the shareholder register on behalf of the company. So what you'll do is you'll prepare what's called a treasury order, which is an instruction and direction to for the tra transfer agent to uh, to issue and deliver common shares to that investor. And then they in turn internally will update the company's shareholder register. So going back to the notion that shares must be fully paid and non-accessible, individual investors may request for the share certificate to be delivered either to their own home or to their broker. If it is going to be delivered to the broker, you need to consider whether the individual investor has already paid for this or if the broker will pay on their behalf. If the broker will be paying on their behalf, then we need to do what's called a delivery against payment or DAP. What this requires is a 48 hours notice to the broker prior to the closing date. It gives them a heads up that, hey, it's Wednesday today. On Friday, we'll be turning up to your office with a share certificate. Please have payment ready. So it gives them enough time so they can either prepare a check or they can uh, complete the wire instruction. 
And then on the day of closing, there will simply just be an exchange of uh, payment for the share certificate. And it, it goes back to payment must occur on or before the date of the share certificate itself. Just a few Canadian securities laws considerations here. Um, I've put it at this point in the process because it typically occurs at closing, but it can definitely arise throughout depending on the circumstances of the private placement. As I said before, if a control person will be made as a result of the private placement, then you need to consider this from the outset. So the first one here is early warning report. This is typically CSC and TSXB issuers. So a filing is triggered by an individual entity acquiring over 10% of the company's shares or where a 10% holder's securities holding will change by more than 10%. So as a result of the private placement, if I was to own 10% of the company's shares, that would, that would trigger a, a filing of a early warning report. If I currently hold 10% and as a result of the private placement, I purchase another 2%, then that will also trigger a filing on my behalf. So what it does, it, uh, it's filed on CEDA, which is a central hub for, for public disclosure here in Canada, within one day of closing of the private placement. It, it, really gives the public a heads up as to oh, minority shareholders in particular as to who is starting to increase their security holdings and just give a transparent look as to who owns what in the company. Just moving on to multi-instrument 61101. Again, this is for the protection of minority security holders in special transactions. This is typically where a director, officer, or someone close to the company will be participating in the private placement. And what it will need is additional disclosure required in the closing news release and stock exchange filings if related parties, which are um, another word for the people who are close to the company that will be participating. There are certain limitations of, uh, of this kind of participation. So it's basically saying that someone who is in or close to the company cannot subscribe in a private placement unless a certain exemption under 61101 applies. Off the top of my head, I think uh, the, the easiest one is that the director, for example, if he was participating, that his subscription or purchase or sale does not exceed 2.5 million Canadian dollars. Uh, another one is where the subscription does not does not go over 25% of the company's market cap. So a couple of others to consider, mainly for CSC and TSXV issuers, the first being SEDI. This is a separate website to CEDA, but it has the same objective of giving a transparent look of the holdings of the directors, officers, and anyone who owns over 10% of the company, all in one place for, for, for the public to see. So where a, uh, where a director, officer, or insider participates in the private placement, they have five days to submit a report on the SEDI website updating their holdings as a result of the private placement. This is typically for CSC and TSXB, as is a material change report. So this is purely um, up to the company as to what constitutes, what constitutes material information for them. As lawyers, you can't make that determination for companies. It's purely on them to make that determination. So if the company deems the private placement material to the company, a report is filed on CEDAR within 10 days of closing of the private placement. So what this will do, this will set out the terms of the private placement um, in an easily accessible central hub, and, and it will be clear 
as, as to the circumstances. For example, if, if I'm a junior company and I have $1 million in the bank and I've just completed a private placement for $1 million, the co company will need to decide if that is material information based on their circumstances. They don't, they're the only ones who knows what they have in the pipeline, how many other assets they have, and they're the only ones who can determine if that private placement is material. The most common consideration is the report of exempt distribution. And the reason for this is that it doesn't just apply to CSE and TSXV, it can, it can also apply to private companies. So what it is, we've now finished our private placement. We've closed it, all of the previous steps have been completed. We need to file with, in this case, the BCSC, the British Columbia Securities Commission, a summary of the transaction itself. Just a note on this, it will be different if there are other uh, investors from other provinces or jurisdictions. For example, Ontario, if the individual is from there, you will also have to file a report of exempt distribution in Ontario. If it's in Alberta, uh, you actually have to file the report on CDAR as well. So there's different things to take into consideration depending on where the investor resides, um, especially in the US. Uh, we can't make the determination as, security, as Canadian securities lawyers as to whether a US filing is required, that would be for US counsel, but it is something that we always see uh, Canadian companies trip up on and they don't necessarily think about it as much as they should. So when it will apply to private companies is when that they will have more than 50 security holders as a result of the private placement. If we take the example that I own my own company and I'm the sole shareholder, if I do a private placement with 48 subscribers for a total of 49 overall, then I will not be required to file a report of exempt distribution. However, if I do a private placement with 50, then I will be required to file a, a report with the BCSC. And depending on the, where the investors reside, I might have to file it on CEDA. I also might have to file it with the OSC or even in the US. This report itself is actually filed within 10 days of the closing date. So it's always something to be, uh, to be considered normally from the outset because it is something that you can trip yourself up on. So just moving on here to final stock exchange filings. Again, this is for CSE and TSXV only. Private companies do not have to uh, worry about this kind of information. So if you're a CSE, you've posted your Form 9 on the website and you've issued your shares, now what you would do is disseminate a news release announcing the closing of the private placement and file it on CDAR. So the news release itself will set out the accurate terms of the private placement. If need be, as we were just talking about 61101, if any directors and officers did participate, then what will be required is that you put additional disclosure in the news release, or even if a control person was made, that would be the same, or if early warning reports were triggered, then you do need to include that kind of disclosure in the news release, and even the material change report, if that is applicable. So some additional requirements here. Uh, for the CSC, it's, it's nearly the same as, as what your initial filings are. So what you need to do is post on the CSC website. So every company will have its own profile on the website. What you need to do is to post a Form 9, a Form 6, and a letter to the CSC. The Form 9 is the same as the initial form that you filed. However, it is now updated, accurate, and complete. Setting out all of the information that needs to be disclosed, including all of the uh, Canadian security laws requirements that we touched on. The Form 6 is a certificate of compliance and what this basically says 
is the company is confirming that it has closed the private placement and it has done everything that it needs to do to date. And in particular, it has complied with CSE policies. The letter to the CSE confirms the receipt of proceeds. So going back to the notion that securities cannot be, that they must be fully paid and non-assessable, what this is is a letter to the CSE confirming that they've received the money from the investor or even the broker uh, for the shares that were issued. Another requirement for the CSE is to produce a legal opinion. So what that does, and that's where we get involved, we need to prepare a legal opinion which says that the common shares issued under the private placement have been duly issued and are outstanding as fully paid and non-assessable shares. And what that will usually require is for us to prepare an officer certificate, a, uh, a document signed off by a CEO or the CFO saying, among other things, you know, the terms of the private placements, everything's been done in accordance with, with policies or regulatory requirements. And I guess in particular that payment has been received from the company, either by the investor or the broker themselves. An additional, and, and just on that legal opinion, it's not posted on the CSE website. This is just emailed to the CSE. And that will typically be the conclusion for CSE issuers. As I said, it's a bit more procedural in nature. You don't get a final approval from the CSE. It's more just, have you completed these, uh, these steps? And if so, then you can consider it done. Just a note uh, on something that you should be aware of. We spoke about control persons earlier, which is someone that will own 20% or more of the shares. If someone is going to own more than 10% of the shares as a result of the private placement, then you need to file what's called a personal information form with the CSE. It's effectively your profile in a sheet it's your contact details it's your it's your background it's your history and i think in particular directors and officers do need to do this anyway and what it does is it assesses your your qualifications if you will to be a director or an officer in particular so it's just something to be wary of before they come back and ask you to do it anyway just moving on to TSXV side of things. It's not too dissimilar to the initial filings that we've done. So what's required is to submit to the TSXV a final form 4B. If you recall to date, what we have done is submitted to the TSXV an initial form 4B with the initial filing fee. Uh, we then received conditional acceptance from the TSXV. They then said, yep, go forth and enclose this thing. So we then issued the common shares. So what we're doing now, again, we have disseminated the news release, which does set out all of these, uh, all of the terms of the private placement, and now we're coming to, to close it. So we'll submit the form. This is a complete reflection of what the private placement can, comprised of, um, as was already set out in the news release. So They'll get both of these documents together. They'll review it side by side uh, and in accordance with TSXV policies. You'll see there that there's an additional filing fee of 0.5% of the funds raised plus GST. So for most junior companies, this isn't going to be an arm and a leg, but it's when you start raising money into the millions where the filing fee can really uh, be something that you forget about. So when you approach the companies and say, hey, here's a $35,000, $40,000 filing fee, then they almost question whether, whether it should have been done in the first place. And it's just something that they don't think about. So we've submitted that to the exchange. Again, similar to the CSE, 
you'll need to consider whether a personal information form is required. If the individual investor is going to be uh, going over 10%. And lastly, you will receive a TSXV final acceptance form. Similar to what we said earlier, the TSXV provide two types of approval, conditional and final. It doesn't always have to be conditional and final. If you know the information already, then what you can do is simply prepare your final form, form B with all the accurate information, uh, send that into the exchange with all the filing fees, etc. Um, and you can just apply for final acceptance. So what that would do is cut a lot of time. It won't necessarily cut any costs, but just going back to stuff that could delay and prevent private placements from closing, um, that, could be, that could be beneficial for any kind of investor. Some of the stumbling blocks, if you were able to get around it, the shareholder meeting, et cetera, could be a delaying factor. I mean, no one wants to wait 90 days or so um, just to get a subscription. And so it can really save a lot of time, but not necessarily any cost there. I realize I have just rushed through this quite uh, quickly. Um, I guess just as, as a point here, we have, uh, I mean, there, there will be steps that we have just kind of brushed over. There are lots of things to consider that haven't been discussed here. Um, for the purpose of the examples and the illustrations, we've tried to condense this as much as possible. So I appreciate that there may be some, uh, some questions or some sort of gaps to fill in some information here. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, bring Siobhan back in and see and see what we have. Thanks, Kyle. Um, for anyone who's still here, that probably seemed a little overwhelming and a little intense. Um, but what Kyle's actually done is he's gone through this, the process from the very beginning to the very end and given you all of the reminder step points that you'll need to know as you go through the process. So what you've had here is basically a crash course in what Kyle and I do almost every day. Um, this is, as I said at the very beginning, this is the bread and butter of what securities lawyers do for our clients, both public and also private, um, in all the various different connotations that are required. And as Kyle very astutely put at the beginning, there are a lot of nuances depending on which province you're in, which province the subscribers are in, and which province your client is in as well. So take this as like an overarching plan but know that there are some tweaks that may be different depending on where you and the client sit within the country or outside the country as well. But Kyle, thank you so much. Like that was a complete deep dive masterclass for any of us who are doing private placements. So thank you for the detail and also just explaining some of the terminology that you went through as well, because securities law has like its whole own language that takes a while to get our heads around, <laughs> I think. It does, and, and I do realize uh, along the way, I was saying some terms, um, and I might not have said, this is another word for this, that, and the other. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's almost second nature to me now that I'm not sure what is kind of legal terminology and what is just uh, everyday, everyday um, speech, really. Absolutely. No, I, I feel the same way. I was like hearing you say it and then you were like, oh, and this also means this. And I was like, yes, it totally does mean that. I would forget to tell somebody that's what it means as well. Um, but we want to open this up to you guys. Do you have some questions for Kyle? Do you, like, it could be about anything he's just said, but generally also about the practice of securities law here in Canada, but also if you want a little bit more information on Kyle's journey to the bar here in BC in particular, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer a few of those as well just throw you under the bus there Kyle with a few questions yeah, yeah. I appreciate that <laughs> but yeah if you guys have questions like either you know raise your hand and you can unmute yourself and you can ask the question or you can use the chat box otherwise you are literally just going to listen to me ramble on and talk to Kyle about securities law so feel free to interrupt me everybody by all means but Kyle, why don't you tell us a little bit more about why did you pick securities law? 
why did I pick securities law? Again, thanks for giving me enough time to think about that one, Siobhan. Um, I, I guess I, <laughs> answer. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I guess I didn't really uh, pick it. It kind of picked me. I mean, I kind of turned up to Canada and I knew I had some corporate M&A experience. I'd never really been in a security setting. Um, I, well, as much as I am right now, anyway, particular corporate finance. I mean, we do corporate commercial work on a daily basis, but in terms of the stock exchange side of it, I never really knew that I that I would enjoy it. Um, and I guess I was just fortunate when I turned up to Canada, and and this was the the first job that I did. Have, and thankfully, uh, it worked out quite nicely. Um, three and a half years later, so yeah, I, I guess you don't really develop a passion in, for, for the stock exchanges. Um, what I will say is it kind of just stumbled upon me. And I guess if you don't know much about it, then of course it could definitely turn you off. But once you're in it, then I realized kind of it was something that I was quite good at. Um, and so I thought I'd give it a go. And as I said, three and a half years later, here we are. I feel like that's um, a common route for people into securities because it's not typically an area you learn about at law school. It, you know, you touch on it a little bit in passing um, because you know, of disclosure and various obligations and things, but it's not typically one of the top courses that you would take. And so really your only exposure to it is in passing if a client happens to do something and then somebody sees that you're kind of good at it and they're like, yeah, you should do more of this. Come on in and do more of it with me. Yeah, exactly. And in particular, if you're not from Canada, I mean, throughout law school or even in the UK or Australia um, and, and even New Zealand, actually, I, I didn't really get a feel for the stock exchange side of it as they do in Canada. I think because Canada although it's not brand new to them, they're still working things out. So it, there's still this trend with different industries and even the stock exchanges that apart from the TSX, especially for the CSE and TSXB, people are, are still have that excitement and hype uh, to, to try and jump, uh, to try and go along for the ride anyway. So yeah, it's, it's not brand new, but it's, it's certainly an interesting topic in Canada. Yeah, I forget that the exchange here is quite young um, and there definitely does feel like that new beginning, new excitement to it all, um, which if you have done any work with the, um, the LSC, the London Stock Exchange, or you've even worked on the AIM market in the UK, it's been around for quite a bit longer. So it's lost that kind of newness, that new beginning freshness to it, and it's become more entrenched there so it doesn't have quite the same excitement i guess as that we have here but if there was one thing you and this i'm throwing you under the bus here but if there's one thing that you wish you'd known before you went into securities law and you could give that piece of advice to somebody else who's considering going into securities law what would it be I think there's, there's a sphere of the unknown, right? So if you have some sort of experience in a corporate setting, but not necessarily securities, you think, well, I'm not going to know anything. So why would I try and go down that route? When in fact, a lot of the skills are very transferable. I mean, it doesn't matter how you pick them up in what industry or even what, what area of law, they, they will always be transferable. So I think the fear of the unknown is definitely something that can, that can prevent someone, but as long as you know kind of you know how to get away get get around the document then then i think your approach will will work for any kind of area absolutely i think one of the things um you talked on this briefly you named some of the forms and you named some of the documents and some of the multilateral instruments and national instruments and i think one of the things with securities law that i've really appreciated is it's codified it's written down and it's all available on the TSXB website and also on the CSC website. And so you can actually just follow the rules. Um, it's not like some areas of law, I think, where you have to kind of look in a million different places and try and like pick through it and work out what they actually mean behind what they say. Um, at least in my experience with this, it's written there. You just have to find the right section. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And especially with other areas of, 
of what I do on a daily basis. Anyway, you, you're not just focusing on one instrument. You're you're bombarded from one to the other and back to the same one. So it's it's a bit of a puzzle, definitely. Once you get your head around it, then it's almost enjoyable, which is <laughs> quite quite sad, really. But um, but yeah, it's just something you, you get familiar with and and uh, you take it in stride, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, so we got a question in for you um, from, and I apologize in advance, I didn't look up how to pronounce every single um, registrant's name, so Yemisi. Um, do you find the corporate finance side of securities law easier or more difficult than the investment fund side? I must say I don't have as much experience with the investment fund side. I've heard from, say, from other law firms in the city that the corporate finance side is a bit easier. Uh, it's more procedural. It's kind of, you have your bearings as to what you have to do from the get-go. With investment funds, I believe, and I'm just speculating here, that there are a couple of instruments that, you know, are hitting in, 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 the, in the trenches and you've just never heard of before getting into it. I suppose it's kind of similar to securities law generally. It's, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So until you're really experienced in that area or, or you work on a transaction where, you know, you are dealing with an investment fund issuer, then you're not going to know. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can't say for sure. I would say the corporate finance side is easier though. Yeah, I don't do a lot of corporate finance either. Um, it tends to be that firms almost segregate between the type of work they do almost and some firms specialize in the corporate finance side and the investment fund side and then other firms specialize in the um the client side of the transactions and so it's not something that i really touch on either because carl and i actually work on similar um clients um we're even in the same building not right now not this second but we are actually based in the same building uh, which is Weird fact for anyone who's in Vancouver, if you need Carl or I, we're in the same building downtown um, on that one. But good question. And I'd be interested to hear from someone who does work with investment funds to see if they'd have the same answer as us, Kyle. Yeah, for sure. I, I do think typically that would be dealt with in-house, right? Quite often because they are, you know, they're an investment fund. So they are much larger entities um, because that's all they're doing. So they quite often do have in-house counsel um, that would lead with a lot of it. And then they will bring in external counsel to do, I think, parts of the transaction. But those who I've worked with on investment funds, they tend to use the same firm or firms over and over and over again. Yeah. So I know we talked about opinions and this is just a random question here. Legal opinions, Kyle, are there any caveats we should have thrown in with legal opinions because it's, it's kind of a meaty document and um, a legal opinion is there any caveats we should throw in any warnings that we should put in people's faces before they think it's just like any other document that we send out there it's it's definitely uh trickier when a company comes to us and we've had no involvement with uh with the private placement and they say that everything's been done in accordance with with stock exchange policies. And, and so we have to kind of go back and, and figure out if what they're saying is true. And nearly all this, nearly every time it's kind of not. So it's a bit of rectification there. Um, for the legal opinion generally, I, 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 there's so much importance on the legal opinion itself. For a CSE private placement, it cannot just be um, the simpler form, but it's still quite tricky. But for other areas, it's almost a nightmare to try and prepare one of those legal opinions because so much understanding of securities law needs to go into it. I mean, it doesn't, it isn't just like a one page sign off and, and that's it. <clears throat> it could be upwards, of, you know, 10 to 20 pages um, of serious analysis. Um, so the caveat is don't think that every legal opinion is going to be the same because it's always nearly not. Absolutely. And it's, it's also us as lawyers saying that everything has been done correctly. So you're almost waving away all your rights that something could be wrong. So be cautious 
as to what you're agreeing in there and don't use it as a standard form template. Like read the contents and know what it is that you're actually agreeing to and confirming has happened. Because as Kyle says, if you haven't been involved in all of the transaction, how do you know it actually took place in the way that you're being told it is? So you need to do your due diligence on that one. And we talk about due diligence and us as lawyers doing our due diligence, it's very important that we do it at every stage on that one. Uh, we've had another question come in. So you mentioned that the exchange is newish. Just out of your experience, is there anything legislation wise or practice wise that needs improvement, especially in light of the pandemic? Well, that is a monstrous question. <laughs> <laughs> That's huge. Thank you, Renal, for that question. Yeah, I mean, I'll try and keep it to nine minutes, but I, I don't know if I can do this. Um, a lot of ch changes have been imposed because of the pandemic. I guess we'll try and keep it to private placements, um, otherwise we'll be here all day. But there was a temporary relief uh, in it. at the start, I believe March or April, and that was to do with the pricing requirements. Um, under TSXB anyway, uh, where the minimum had to be five cent, the higher a five cent in the discounted market price. I believe that that was waived down to one cent. So junior companies who were struggling in the pandemic could still complete private placements. And that's if their share price was say five cents. So they were definitely struggling, struggling at the time. And that was one of the things that the TSXB brought in. Uh, they extended it a couple of times. I believe that it has been extended to June of this year. I'm not sure if it's been re-extended. That was one of the things that I noticed. The exchanges were trying to help junior companies. In terms of legislation that needs to come in to, to fix a few things, there's always going to be some. Uh, I know that one of the partners at my firm is on the TSXB uh, executive committee and they are dealing with what's called CPCs or capital pool companies. And they have just implemented new legislation for, uh, for companies who want to do their initial public offering and then go on to find a qualifying transaction. So there was new legislation that came in, I should say policies, not legislation, uh, and that came in uh, for the better, which is great to see. It's not to say that all of the all of the uh, interpretational policies have been excluded, but at the end of the day, the TSXV will always have discretion to to waive something if they think that legit that one of their policies does not necessarily reflect uh, what's what it should have been done for, given like the uh, the evolution of time, etc. Absolutely. I mean, I just saw that there's a proposed amendment that's been released this morning to continuous disclosure ob obligations um, that's coming out as well. Now, this is from the Commission, um, from the BCSC, but you know, it has a knock on effect with the exchange as well. And so there's always changes happening. Um, there is a big review panel that exists within the exchanges and the commissions, and they're always going through various updates and tweaks and they send out weekly bulletins of what's going on with all of these um and i, I agree i think there's going to be some more changes coming um down the pipeline because i think the last year has shown an increased exacerbation in some of the deficiencies or challenges that companies are finding using the exchanges and the platforms um, and then there's also growth in how people are raising money. Um, I don't know if you're seeing it, Kyle, but people who are using crowdfunding to um, raise funds as well. And so there's new legislation or new policies um, that have come out around that as a vehicle for raising capital as well. Um, and I think we'll continue to see tweaks and changes to that as that platform um, becomes more widely used, um, especially around um, the emerging and junior markets. Um, on that one. We've got one final question. Um, does the CSE cater to placements for just emerging companies or other issuers? Big picture question, Kyle. Yeah, big big picture from, from a high level, I guess. Any any issuer listed on the CSE can complete the private placement. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of industry or, or area you are, emerging or established, I guess, um, you are able to complete the private placement. Uh, all you have to do is comply with their policies. 
Absolutely. And, and the reason we have two exchanges, well, I guess we have more, um, but we have the two main ones, you know, we have the CSE, the TSX, but we also have the TSXV, um, and we also have NEX as well that exists, um, is they all have different requirements of normally financial requirements and asset requirements as to which one you can be placed on. And then they have different obligations that are then required as you go up through them. So, you know, you may find that there's a lot more um, junior issues and emerging companies on the CSE or potentially the TSXV um, and definitely on NEX, um, whereas you'll have the more established um, companies maybe are on the TSX. And it's just because there's more com more obligations on the company and a few more costs. And so if you're starting out as a company, you want to reduce that um, because it's just adding additional burdens to you. So that might depend on what type of companies you'll see on different exchanges. Um, but there seems to be quite a blurring of the lines um, recently between where they sit as well. So it's not so straight cut that you'll only see emerging companies like on the CSE, for example. You'll also find them on other exchanges too on that one. Kyle, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I'm saving it. I'm going to give it to all of my juniors um, as an introduction of how to do private placements. Um, because It was fantastic. Um, you were obviously incredibly knowledgeable. It's great. I can't wait for us to get Kyle to come back and talk to us about something else that he does in the future. Uh, so Kyle, have a fantastic week. Everyone else, thank you for all of your questions. Thank you for your involvement. We look forward to you joining us next time. We have a session coming up on franchise law. Um, so keep looking at our social media channels for that. We're also doing a session on how to work with paraprofessionals and your support staff. So for all of those of you who've maybe not really worked with a support team before, that might be a really um, good one to join as well. So you can hear from paraprofessionals as to how they like to work with their lawyers as well on this one. Uh, we will be taking a break over the summer, but we're gonna come back in September and we hope to have you all involved then. But until then, we hope to see you on a few of our future um, exciting events. So Kyle, thank you again very much. Thank you very much.